The music of Johnny Thunder's So Alone is the color of black hair. It is the sound of machines being manipulated by addicts and criminals under conditions of destitution. All love is wretchedness. We listen to rock and roll to escape the terror of history, to escape its fragmentations and ceaseless changes. Johnny's music does not impart anything approaching truth, but instead offers a profound sense of the real, the morbid, the uncontrollable, the unwholesome. Let us dispense with a detailed list of who played what, where, and what a toxicology report of each of the, at the time, living bodies might have revealed. All rock music is palimpsest, just as is rock journalism, with its endless recitation of the same words and events. It would be a waste of time to illustrate this point by citing fact after banal fact, so let's instead simply attempt to situate Johnny in a different milieu, a different light. Johnny Thunders, like many rock musicians of a certain, perhaps vanishing ilk, was a consummate sufferer. He cultivated the deepest level of suffering and picked the perfect career to exploit it. A surface examination of this statement would seem easy to confirm. He was a junkie who wasted every opportunity that came his way. A man in revolt, he lived in a permanent state of bad faith. Ignored, of course, is the fact that there was a metaphysical yearning in his search for oblivion, in his self-laceration. With that in mind, we should consider placing Johnny Thunders in a tradition alongside Jean Genet, Simone Vai, and Antonin Artaud. Jean Genet has stated that crime, sexual degradation, even murder, were threshold experiences that led to the highest glory. Simone Vai believed that the proof of God's existence was in his absence, and that the most dire affliction was evidence of this absent God's love. Up until quite recently, the heroes of our liberal affluent society have been its opposite, anti-liberal, anti-bourgeois. They've been obsessive, ill-mannered outsiders who use violence in all its variety to leave their mark. Think of Lucian Freud with his spurned mistresses, multi-million dollar gambling debts, and sizable complement of illegitimate children. Sanity to such artists was a form of cowardice. Their impact was to achieve by the extremity of their personal lives and their intellectual points of view, a totalizing vision that went against the grain of our supposedly polite, civilized world. These violent, profligate destroyers of the self have been considered, perhaps until now, the true heralds of the real. The body of work Johnny left behind is little more than fragments, shards of black glass strewn here and there, mostly overshadowed by the physical, spiritual, and moral wreckage of his life. Perhaps in our own decentered, disjointed time, this can be considered a success. Fragments, after all, are the art objects par excellence of the 21st century. As such, so alone is his masterwork, his one complete statement, a compendium of jagged, melancholy, yet perfect fragments. I had one opportunity to see Johnny perform, in Hartford, Connecticut of all places, and was reminded, in retrospect of course, of Hegel being thunderstruck by the sight of Napoleon entering Jena on horseback. To see such an individual, this world soul, who, concentrated here in a single point, reaches out over the world and masters it. Yet watching Johnny's subsequent performance, an event more primitive ritual than concert, one understood that beauty was never given a second thought. Tragic jubilation was his goal, readily apparent in his brutal, minimalist guitar playing and impromptu, scabrous, psychosexual monologues. During those excruciating, tedious, yet somehow terrifying digressions, his misgivings about being a performer attained the highest degree of tension. Though it is an article of faith that Johnny never read a word of Artaud's writings on the theater of cruelty, the parallels are jarring. Artaud, a frequent inmate of the sanitarium, would stalk the stage muttering, whispering, staggering as if drunk, like a boxer on the verge of being knocked out. Then, galvanized either by theory or madness, he would come alive and harangue his audience, using language that any Johnny Thunders fan would immediately recognize. Is there anyone here young enough to get a heart on? You smell of syphilis. You smell of the outhouse, of the lunatic asylum. Johnny even looked like Arto. Both men died young of drug overdoses after disappointing careers that uneasily mixed together horror and joy. 
Perhaps the time of the artist visionary as extremist is over. Perhaps there will be no more Johnny Thunders, no more near panelists, globe-trotting drug addicts, continuously traversing the capitals of the world, pockets brimming with narcotics, trailing an ever-growing arrest record. Such a scenario seems impossible to imagine in 2023. Simone Vai described the contours of our created world, restless necessity, distress, wretchedness, the crushing burden of poverty, unending labor that wears us out, cruelty, torture, violent death, constraint, disease. She described all these as the hallmarks of divine love. The same centrifugal forces that compelled Johnny to inject heroin into his arm, to abandon his wives and children, also compelled him to pick up the guitar and leave a permanent mark on the world. Perhaps Simone Vi was right. God can only love himself.